What is the best time to have intercourse, or what I like to refer to as consensual coitus? Now, many of you might fall into the camp of any time is the best time to have sex or intercourse. Well, is that true? And are there anatomical and physiological considerations that might make one time better than the other? Well, in today's video, we're gonna answer some of these questions and look at it from, say, like a reproductive standpoint, as well as an enjoyment in performance standpoint. We'll take a look at some testes and ovaries and look at various hormones to help us answer this question of the best time for consensual coitus. It's gonna be full of all sorts of anatomical awesomeness. So let's do this. So let's quickly start with the male perspective because one could potentially argue that males could be ready to go anytime, anyplace, anywhere. And this idea comes from the way in which sperm cells are produced. So let's have a blast from the past, my younger self, explain how this sperm production applies to what we're talking about by taking a look at a right testicle. And you can see this is the actual right testis here. Pretty amazing structure, but we need to show the internal anatomy of this right testis. Here we go. Look how amazing that is inside. And if you look closely in there, it almost looks like there's little, these little stringy type things here. And these little stringy things are tiny little tubes that are in each testis, and these little stringy tubes are called the seminiferous tubules. There are up to 900 of these in each testis. That's why, again, it looks like little stringy things that are tiny. And these seminiferous tubules are where sperm cells are produced, and producing sperm at what some may consider an alarmingly high rate. They can produce up to 300 million sperm cells in one day. If we were to average that out over a day, that's approximately 12.5 million per hour, 208,000 per minute, and about 3,500 per second. I just created 3,500 sperm cells and 3,500 more. Look at me go. So based on what we learned there from a reproductive standpoint, males should be able to reproduce at pretty much any time. But from say like just a daily performance standpoint, is there a best time of day for males to participate in intercourse? Well, testosterone levels tend to be the highest in the morning around 8 a.m. And as many males have experienced, this often comes coupled with increased libido and sex drive, and also is coupled with that magical increased ability to maintain an erection. Oh my god! I'm sorry, it's morning. Now, having the potential for increased performance in the morning is one thing, but are there actual benefits to having intercourse in the morning? Often when you hear about the benefits of intercourse, you'll hear people talk about the release of certain chemicals like release of endorphins from the brain or release of hormones like oxytocin, for example. Endorphins are these natural painkillers that the body releases, but they're also associated with feelings of pleasure and euphoria. Oxytocin also has many functions, but this hormone is linked to connection and bonding and why it's often nicknamed the love hormone. Now, people have been surveyed about morning intercourse, and many people have reported increased connection to their partners, a decrease in stress levels throughout the day, as well as increased happiness throughout the day. And many have also even reported that they felt more productive while at work. So, at the very least, we should consider participating in morning intercourse so that we can be more productive members of society. And we do have to say that not everyone reported those benefits. And it doesn't mean that people couldn't have amazing bouts of intercourse at other times throughout the day. So what should we do with all this? Yes, there are some potential benefits of morning intercourse that could prickle throughout the day. But I think some of the best advice that people could be given is that it could be wise for someone to practice having consensual coitus at multiple different times throughout the day. And then, of course, document, write it down for science so that you can know the pros and the cons and what works best for you. So now let's take a look at this from the female perspective. And as you can see, we've got some charts and some hormones listed up here to help us understand the female sex cycle so that we can figure out if there's a best time for females to participate in intercourse. Now, one of the things that I do wanna mention is that the female sex cycle is super awesome and amazing. And I think when people understand this, they tend to have a better appreciation for reproduction. And you might also notice that I said female sex cycle. A lot of people will refer to it as like the menstrual cycle or just the monthly cycle. But most physiology books will call it the female sex cycle. And you can see we've listed it from day zero to day 28. 
Keep in mind there can be variation in this depending on the female, anywhere from 20 days up to 45 days, but we kind of put it in the middle or close to the average of about a month or 28 days. So let's start with follicle stimulating hormone. And we're not talking about stimulating hair follicles here, we're talking about stimulating follicles that are inside the ovaries or ovarian follicles. Now an ovarian follicle is just a single layer of cells that encompasses or encases an ovum or an egg. So think of the follicle as like this little container for a single egg. Now at the beginning of the cycle, you'll see a little bit of a bump in this FSH. And just FYI, the beginning of the cycle, day zero, is when menstruation or bleeding and those period cramps start. And again, that's accompanied with that little bump in follicle stimulating hormone. And that FSH will cause about six to 12 ovarian follicles to start to develop and mature. What's interesting and important to note is that even though six to 12 start to develop and mature, typically only one fully develops and matures and will release its egg. And we'll get to that in just a second. But let's go to luteinizing hormone real quick. You can see about the middle of the cycle, it spikes like crazy. And this spike in luteinizing hormone, this causes ovulation to occur. And it does get a little synergistic bump from that follicle stimulating hormone as well. But we need that luteinizing hormone to cause ovulation. Now, if you haven't heard of ovulation or don't know what it is, we can just say that it's pretty much when the ovary releases that egg from that one mature follicle that we saw. Now, there are times where people can be like hyper ovulators or ovulate more than one egg or release more than one egg. And if both of those eggs or multiple eggs got fertilized, that's when you would have like non-identical twins, or at least that's what people will refer to them as, but they have the same likeness as like any other sibling. But again, most of the time, one egg gets released during ovulation during a 28 day cycle. Compare that to 300 million plus sperm cells per day. That's crazy to think about. And to make it even more crazy is once that one egg gets released, that egg will only last for 24 hours. So you might be thinking, how in the world did we create so many humans if the egg only lasts for 24 hours? Well, let's see if we can do some things to potentially increase the odds of fertilization in creating a human. Well, one of the things that we'll see is that we've got this other chart here. We've got the estrogen in red and the progesterone in blue. We're not gonna talk much about the progesterone. We've got some other videos that go into more details that I'll link to this video. But with the estrogen, we're gonna see that the estrogen starts to greatly increase around that same time or prior to ovulation at day 14 and prior to that spike in luteinizing hormone. Now, estrogen does some amazing things with female anatomy and physiology. But one of the things that it also gets involved in is increases in libido and sex drive. And what I often will tell students is that it makes sense to potentially increase sexual desire, libido, around or prior to releasing an egg. And what's interesting is, you know, maybe that female's partner forgot to do the dishes or forgot to mow the lawn or forgot to text her back or whatever it may be. But because of that huge spike in estrogen, that might make the female overlook the shortcomings of that partner because estrogen is saying, we don't care about all those things, we need to participate in successful reproductive intercourse. Now, that increases the potential likelihood to participate in intercourse around ovulation, but that doesn't really extend that 24 hour window. What can, in a way, extend that 24 hour window is what I like to refer to as those pesky little sperm cells. Those pesky little sperm cells have been known to last three to five days in the female reproductive tract after intercourse. Some studies have shown even potentially up to seven days in rare cases, but the majority of the time we're talking three to five days. So that means if the egg gets released on day 14 during ovulation, lasts 24 hours to day 15, that means from day 15, if we had intercourse three to five days prior to that, maybe even seven days if you had super crazy Kryptonian sperm cells, but again, more like three to five days prior to that, you could have successful reproductive intercourse because those sperm cells would be ready and waiting if they were in there prior to ovulation. Now, if we're talking what is the best day or time from a reproductive standpoint from the female, we're talking the day before ovulation and the day of ovulation would be the prime time to have intercourse, again, if we're talking about reproduction. So let's go into a little bit more detail of why in the world is there such a huge difference between male and female gamete production? The gametes just being the eggs and the sperm cells. Now, with the female, we did see that only one egg is typically released during a full 28-day cycle, whereas males, we had those 300 
million plus sperm cells created per day. So why in the world would you need 300 million sperm cells per day if there's only one egg released per 28 day cycle? Well, you can definitely make the argument for the shotgun approach. Release as many sperm cells onto one potential target to increase your odds of fertilization and having successful reproductive intercourse. There's also the perspective of with female humans, they have what's called a concealed ovulation. They don't go into heat like other animals do and have those uh, more obvious signs of being in that state of getting ready to ovulate like the other animals. And speaking from a male perspective, I have no idea when a female is ovulating. It's not like I have ovulation radar or what we could call an ovdar or some ovulation spidey sense. Now, some females have an idea sometimes when they're ovulating. Some might notice that they have actual ovulation pain. They can notice a slight increase in body temperature, changes in cervical mucus, and even things like breast tenderness. But that's still not perfect because there are some people who will try to do birth control by avoiding having intercourse during that time period around ovulation and sometimes they get it wrong and they end up with a little bit of a surprise. But again, coming back from this to this male perspective of not having ovdar or some ovulation spidey sense, it would therefore make sense to create as many sperm cells as possible so that the male can always be prepared and ready to go for the glorious ovulation day. And let's wrap this up with one more thing about the female perspective because Likely, most females are going to want to have intercourse more than once per 28 day cycle. So like we did with males earlier, is there a better time or best time to have intercourse from the enjoyment or the performance aspect for females? Well, some researchers have shown that estrogen levels could be a little bit higher in the afternoon. Now don't get me wrong, we're not talking about those huge spikes that we saw on the graph, but just slightly higher than say at other times of the day with also potentially elevated cortisol levels where the female might feel more energetic, a little bit more of an increased sex drive and might have a great time during the afternoon. However, there are also plenty of females who reported similar things to males with intercourse in the morning. So we come back to this whole situation from an emotional, a connection, a performance, and even an enjoyment standpoint, there's not a definitive answer, which probably isn't that shocking to everybody. But again, I would say for females and everybody, do that own self reported research where you practice consensual coitus throughout the day and see what works best for you. And what's interesting about this is I always joke with my students and say our brains are sometimes too big and too smart for our own good because our sexual desire uh, preferences and how we participate in intercourse is much more complex than other animals. We have all these things that get involved with attraction and how we participate in intercourse more than just what our hormones are telling us. So if we cut out all the fluff of, like I said, the connection, the emotions, the enjoyment, performance, etc., and we just became biological reproductive robots, then yes, we could say the best time to have intercourse is in the morning on day 14, right before ovulation. One of my favorite things about teaching anatomy and physiology and just about the human body is the ability to apply that information to real world situations. So if you enjoy learning how to better apply scientific principles to real life situations or just learning more about science in general, you'll likely love the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant.org is an amazing interactive online learning platform for STEM subjects. It's one of the best places to learn math, science, and computer science. They have thousands of different lessons and they're adding new lessons each and every month. I've personally been using Brilliant for over a year and some of my favorite lessons are on scientific thinking because I constantly want to improve my ability to think critically, logically, and again, apply that information to real world situations. And the funny thing is, is I'm not in school anymore. So you don't have to be a student if you're just a lifelong learner like me, or maybe you are in high school or in college, Brilliant will have courses that are definitely applicable to you no matter where you are on your educational journey. And I really think you'll enjoy these intuitive, hands-on interactive lessons from Brilliant. They're a great balance of fun, yet challenging enough to push you to the next level. So if you're interested, go to brilliant.org slash IHA to get started on a free 30 day trial. Plus the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual subscription. We'll also include that link in the description below. And of course, thanks for watching our videos, everyone. If you feel the need, like and subscribe, leave some comments below. Let us know what you thought of the video and what you might want to see in the future. And of course, we'll see you next time.